911 Talk Podcast, Episode 82, for Monday, April 30th, 2012. Welcome to this edition of E911 Talk with your host, Mark Fletcher, Pilot Line Manager for Emergency Services at Avaya. Now, here's Fletch. Emergency dispatchers around the world field many calls that are categorized as silent calls, no answer calls, or hoax calls. Many times these are attributed to a phenomenon known in the industry as butt dials, bum dials, or pocket dials. With the mass proliferation of cellular devices in the world today, it's no wonder that these devices are the culprits for the bulk of these types of calls. Another source in the past has been accidental dialing of an emergency number from behind a PBX. This commonly occurs when calls to an area code that start with 9-1 or international calls where the user dialed 1-1 instead of 0-1-1 after dialing 9 for an access code. The cellular industry has responded by eliminating the function of one-touch dialing of emergency numbers on the device itself. PBX manufacturers address the problem by implementing dialing plan functionality that can be programmed into the translation tables that can significantly reduce or even eliminate the problem. There is another source of silent calls, though, that isn't discussed too often, and the user community that is impacted by this is one that you might not be aware of and may surprise you. The community I'm referring to is those with speech or hearing disabilities. From a 911 or 112 perspective, we've treated this community of users as second-class citizens as they've been relegated to using a technology that is commonly referred to as TDD, or Telecommunications Device for the Deaf, or TTY, teletypewriters. In most cases, these devices require an analog line or have an acoustic coupler that allows them to be used with most any desk telephone handset. They're typically the size of a small typewriter and based on today's standards, a pretty clumsy box to carry around with you. Also, their compatibility with cell phones can be challenging, as well as codec issues with voice over IP. Because of the bulkiness and the reliance on having a handset to place in the acoustic coupler, these devices are only considered to be portable. Mobility is really not something they do well. With carriers advancing their user technology every two years or so, and the systemic technological stagnation of the emergency services networks worldwide, the feature gap between users and public safety widens every single day. FCC Chairman Julius Janikowski has been very vocal on this and has been quoted several times stating that the unfortunate truth is that the capability of our emergency response communications has not kept pace with commercial innovation. In the 70-page report that was issued by the FCC's Emergency Access Advisory Committee, recommendation T2.2 stated that the EAC recommends that the FCC remove the requirement for TTY support for new IP-based consumer devices that implement IP-based text communications that include, at a minimum, real-time text or an LTE environment IMS multimedia telephone, which includes real-time text, unquote. But before we can remove that requirement, we need to make texting to emergency services a reality. Several trials have been launched in cities around the United States, Black Hawk, Iowa, Durham, North Carolina, and most recently, the entire state of Vermont have all implemented pilot programs that allow users to send text messages to the 911 centers. Now, although this is encouraging, when you read the fine print, it's hard to determine what they're actually testing, and there seems to be quite a few restrictions that users need to be made aware of. For example, in the Vermont trial, users are cautioned that Customers should only use the texting option when a voice call to 911 is not an option. Sending a text to 911 may take longer than a voice call because someone must enter the text, send it through the system, and then the 911 call taker has to enter a text response and send it back. Time is critical in a life-threatening emergency and customers should be aware of this difference. Providing location information and the nature of the emergency in the first message is imperative. The Williston Peace app will not be able to access the cell phone location or speak with the person who is sending the text. Customers must be in range of the cell towers in Vermont. If customers are outside or near the edge of the state, the message may not reach the Williston Peace app. Texts to 911 have the same 160 character limit as other text messages. Verizon Wireless customers must have mobile phones that are capable of sending text messages. Text messages to 911 will count either against their messaging bundle or be charged at 20 cents per message. Now, the issue is not restricted to the United States, though. At the recent European Union Emergency Services Workshop, sponsored by ENA in Riga, Latvia, several vendors were showing off product and concepts dealing with similar issues. 
So what exactly is the problem? Why is texting to 911 so difficult when we can text any other device in the world? Well, one difference is that the voice network that can correlate location information is not used when sending a text message. Texting is a data function and location mechanisms simply don't exist in that environment. Although the originating device is aware of its location through various forms of discovery, it's unable to send that information or determine the actual destination address of the appropriate piece out. I guess it's like sending an email to a friend of yours overseas and addressing it to London. There's just no way for your friend to get that message or for the network to direct that message to them specifically. This is why the trials that exist here in the United States are limited. They use 911 as a pointer to a five digit short code that terminates at a specific piece app. Location isn't sent, and there are questions as to if callback is even possible. They're typically restricted to a single piece app and a single carrier. So although I applaud the industry for trying to move the stake forward, at the same time, I fear of a false sense of security that could be instilled in the general public who really doesn't have the technical background to digest what's actually happening. I think we all can agree, sending a text message to a five-digit short code works just fine. Haven't we proved that over the last decade with American Idol results? This is where the app may be able to play an important role here. Now, we've talked before about Fresh, Share with 911, and Smart 911. These are all great ideas, but what they lack is a common infrastructure at the Peace app. In a way, they're all proprietary in the client to server communication. That makes me believe that maybe it's time for some redirection of effort. If the app truly solves the problem, and all three of those companies believe that it will, let's standardize the back end so we don't accidentally create a proprietary pairing of software between the public user and public safety. Last week, I added any network to the list of anywhere, anytime, and any device. This week, I think I'll add any app. You've been listening to the E911 Talk Podcast with your host, Mark Fletcher, Product Line Manager for Emergency Services at Avaya. E911 Talk is a weekly podcast available on sites like this, as well as iTunes, and is available free of charge. If you have any comments or questions, you can email Fletch at FletcherM at Avaya.com. That's Fletcher, the letter M, at Avaya.com. Be sure to listen in next week for more informative topics on E911.